Hi, uh, so my name's Chris Game. Uh, this is what I look like on GitHub. Um, so uh, I want to talk to you today about uh, the router uh, and I guess more uh, practical examples how to use it. So I guess when I first started uh, learning this stuff, I struggled with the docs because to me they document, so I now know they document very well exactly what, what is going on. Um, but what they don't do is kind of show you examples of how to use it. So, so it's quite hard. I guess you, what I was doing initially was approaching them how I would other documentation where I'd, I'd go through and I'd look through the navigation and I'd try and find something that suggested that, that this was the error I needed to be looking. And then I'd read that piece in entirety and that was it. And that's not enough because it's really written more like a book. You need to kind of start and read through the lot and then you understand what's going on. So... I guess if there's one takeaway from this talk today is that, that this is a, a, a kind of example of, of how to get some of these things working uh, to start with that you can just pull down and it does work so you can actually pick through it and I'll go through it kind of uh, exactly what's going on because um, I think that would really have helped me to start with basically so this is aimed at kind of people people just starting out um, so <coughs> so yeah uh, roots maneuver because you know it had to be slightly comical it's loosely used in the talk um, so essentially I want to talk about two different examples so the first one is uh, to do with nested resources so I guess this is kind of one of those things where uh, you re can really see what kind of use cases they were thinking of when they built this because uh, the idea of stacking up um, uh, kind of data structures, so a, a very relational hierarchical model, the kind of CRUD kind of data, data stuff fits really well with this. Um, so what I've tried to do here is just show the absolute minimal stuff you can do uh, uh, in order to get uh, this kind of URL structure working, the fetching of the data coming back um, and, and the information being returned to the screen. So, so the example is just uh, essentially you've got an artist collection, we've only got one artist in there, uh, font size on both, yeah. So yeah, I should say as well, I've got, um, so this is an option in the configuration to just uh, get it to log out any of the transitions that are going on. So you can see that kind of as we're going through as to what's, what's happening. So essentially there's, there's a few levels to these. So um, basically we're going through and uh, we're first picking an artist uh, so that artist has an ID of one, uh, we're then picking an album that happens to have an ID of one as well and then we're listing out all the tracks on the screen. Um, so what happens in the background when you see that, that going through is it's actually making a load of requests. So uh, this is an Embassy CLI app, these are all built in the HTTP mocks that you can use uh, and it's using uh, the, the kind of REST adapter, so JSON API structure. Um, so if I refresh that now uh, we can basically see it go through and make all those calls. So I've put some delays on some of them just so you can see it kind of building up slowly. But you can see it's actually going away and it's fetching that data uh, based on the relationships that exist in the model layer. So, um, yeah, so I guess if I show you that uh, in code, um, so we're talking about the routes here that are just artist, uh, so resources, sorry, of artist, uh, artists, and then within that artist and then album. So. Uh, in here you've got quite a strong uh, convention uh, which is that you're using the, the name uh, of the root uh, and then an underscore ID on it. So what that means is that, that when this goes away and actually uh, executes the root, um, uh, you don't actually need to declare those. So if you look in here I've got a, a, a root for uh, album uh, and artists but not for artist because Essentially what it's doing is uh, exactly the same as this line here for the model where uh, it's just doing a find on the store with that album ID, but, but that's just convention. Like it's just going to do that for you because that's what it's expecting. Um, so uh, yeah, so I guess if I show you the, the templates that come with that as well. So the other thing that's going on uh, is that when you go say into artists, we've got uh, so an artist root, which is a, a resource, but we're not using the, the index uh, template, we're using the actual main template. So what that means is that when that's rendered on the screen, 
it will stay there and then whatever you're, you've got nested inside it will then render inside the outlet. So that allows you to stack that uh, information, to stack the kind of templates to match the URL structure. So you might think that looks a bit mental at the moment in terms of why would you build an app that looked like that, but a lot of the things that you perhaps would use later on, say like Emberfire and stuff like that, use that method of having everything on the DOM, but it orchestrating what's shown uh, to kind of give you a, a, a kind of nice user interaction where as you go deeper into the nested routes, you're kind of overlaying a screen and you're building it up and you can drop back through that just by going back. Um, so I guess the interesting stuff here really is that um, I'm saying uh, each artist in the model for this. So this is the, the top level of my models. Um, so uh, essentially we've got an artist that's related to albums uh, and that's an async relationship. Uh, and then that in turn uh, is related to tracks, which is also an async relationship. So what that's meaning is that until I actually request data from that relationship, it's not going to be fetched. Um, so that again is basically uh, showing that, that when, you, when you come through, the only thing that's causing that to, to get evaluated is the fact that in the template for, uh, say, uh, uh, for artist, is that I say each album uh, and, and then request from the model the album's relationship, and that's going to go through and request each one of those um, just through Ember data uh, and then build them on the screen. So uh, all that's downstream of the models is just the adapter, which um, is pretty much your bog standard REST adapter um, that's just using uh, the API namespace just uh, because that's what I've got set up on the stubs. Uh, what's the default for the stubs? Um, so I guess there's a few interesting things there. Just if you do uh, like try and build this yourself, like th it's very specific because you're you're only relying on that relationship actually fetching the data. If the payload that you've returned isn't in the right format, then it won't understand what's going on. So there's a, a discrepancy between how that works with uh, uh, JSON API and and say the. Um, the, the kind of uh, uh, active model serializers from, from Rails. So uh, that's mainly around the, the, just the formatting. So in here, the fact that my uh, I've got tracks uh, listed there rather than uh, track IDs, I think it is for the active model serializers, and that will just stop it working. So that's one, one to watch out for. Um, but essentially, you can see that going through, and really, there's such minimal code there. All you're doing is, is just describing the relationship of the models, setting that rest uh, adapter up, which is just as, as simple as, as yeah, specifying where you want it to go. And then uh, the route is doing all the work for you. So, so as you, you go through, it's picking those IDs up uh, and, then, and then fetching everything back. So I guess uh, this is kind of illustrated with, uh, I think I've seen this diagram banded around quite a bit, so to, to try and explain exactly what's going on. So that's fine for, for um, how a normal route is rendered, if you like. Um, but I guess what I didn't realize to start with is that there's a bit more going on there because that's just you rendering the initial data. But as soon as that template's rendered and you try and evaluate that, that each that, that lists through the objects, really then what's happening is you're actually kind of doing a bit of this as well. So like it's going back and asking the model that's been set on the controller for those relationships. And because they're declared as async, then that's actually going back to the store. The store's then going out over the wire, uh, over the adapter to then go and fetch that data back. Um, so um, yeah, so I feel like it's kind of, uh, again, one of those things where, depending on how you use it, there's a bit more going on than perhaps it seems initially. And initially, that is quite a lot to get your head around in the first place. Um, so. Uh, there's a few more things with that, so um, you might have noticed when uh, I went into here before and uh, navigated all the way through this that we'd got uh, some of these uh, relationships. When there's nothing happening, there's nothing to show yet, you get a loading route. So that's basically a substate that's on each one of those routes. Um, now that kind of seems quite trivial, but it actually changes a lot what's happening. So. Um, if you saw the talk that Aaron did the other week about how that transition objects works and it gets passed through the, the kind of uh, the various routes that are transitioning, what you're doing by doing this is saying that so you, you know that, that some of this information is going to take a long time to return and by doing it it means that you don't lock the screen up so it will start rendering the previous outlets because 
when you when you move into that, it's effectively evaluating each one of those routes that's specified on the URL. So artist, then artist with the ID of one, album with the ID of one. Uh, and if you didn't have any loading routes in that situation, it wouldn't render anything until all of them had resolved. So by by kind of specifying these loading routes, you allow it to, to kind of partially or, or to render the screen, but know it's going to go back to another state once the data actually arrives. But what that means is that when the route is making the, the, the transitions, it's not doing what it normally does, which is not making the, the, the jump to the next part of the URL unless it's happy, everything's been satisfied. So that means that you then end up having to handle the, you've got like an error substate as well because that's kind of where you've got to handle that stuff. So it's literally going to transition straight away and then just expect the data to come back afterwards. So um, there's quite a lot going on there just uh, by, by specifying that. Um, and I guess the other thing I just wanted to show, which is a bit contrived and some pretty horrible looking code, but um, I think serves a purpose, um, which is um, in the uh, route for uh, album, I've got this horrible before model looking thing, um, which might look a bit better like that. Um, so essentially, uh, the transition objects, I'm only just beginning to understand. I don't think there's a huge amount of docs from what I could find out for it, but so I don't think accessing underscore data is a very good thing, so I wouldn't recommend doing that. But essentially, it's quite impressive that the, actually all the data that you build up as you go through those routes is in that transition object. So, so as you're going down that, uh, I'm able to go and fetch the number of albums that were in the uh, uh, that were returned when, when the artist was requested and the albums returned back and then fetch out the uh, ID of the one that's on the route for where I'm going to transition to and then also fetch the ID of that last album back and essentially what that allows me to do is validate before I go and fetch the data whether there is an album that exists for that um, so this is a bit contrived but, but you get the idea that essentially uh, because you've got in here only uh, eight albums uh, awesome as they were um, if you were to put in here, or sorry, seven albums, awesome as they were, uh, if you were to put in uh, album eight in here, then essentially uh, what I've told it to do is just stop and go back to the, the nearest uh, uh, route that it can, which in this case is to transition back to artists, so you can pick one of the, the albums that is valid. Um, but I guess, yeah, there's kind of, there's a lot going on in there, basically, that you can, you can fetch that information out. Um, and so, I guess that's that's kind of cool. That's your your kind of crud, like uh, kind of UI, if you like. That that your data is all hierarchical and all quite nested, and I guess that's great for for writing admin consoles and stuff like that. But what happens when you're trying to do the right thing? You're trying to have all your state in the URL, but essentially you haven't got one. So the next example I want to show you is uh, a dashboard which essentially is, uh, I guess, uh, now awfully formatted, uh, is um, essentially a, a, a kind of scenario that I guess is not uncommon to an app, but it, I didn't really see that it was kind of covered anywhere in the documentation that was up there. So um, this is correct, I think, in terms of the fact that you haven't re you know, really badly decided on a URL structure. You're basically saying that you've come in and you've logged in and essentially there is no more state to the app other than the fact you're logged in and you're looking at this page. So in this case, it's just called dashboard. Um, but essentially all the data you're getting back is, is based on the fact that you've identified yourself by some other means. And, and so we've assumed, I'm assuming this has just happened from this, this point in the example. Um, but essentially you're gonna go away and you're gonna need to fetch um, a load of information based on that user. So in this case, we're saying five different services that, that are all kind of able to return that information. Um, so I guess, you know, thinking about this, it's kind of, there's a lot of ways of doing it, but, but really trying to make it work in a way where it deviates the least amount possible from Ember's standard way of doing it, i.e. what you'd normally expect to happen is that the route would make some kind of request uh, and fetch a model that would then be set on a controller, and then you'd have a template that rendered that controller. Um, so essentially, the way I've approached that here is that you've got, uh, so if I show you the diagram of what's going on, it might make it easier. Um, so essentially, all the root does is um, set up a load of requests. Um, so using the run loop, it will just basically schedule those requests to happen at some point. So rather than it resolving in the model hook and blocking the flow, 
uh, it's going to bypass that um, in the after model. I've I've said it too, but but essentially it, it you know could could go in the setup controller as well. But essentially what you're doing is saying off the kind of main thread, if you like, I want to go away and do this stuff, and I know it's going to happen later, and that's fine. So the the main execution can run through as normal. The root evaluates. There isn't any model. There's no blocking. It schedules these things to happen on the run loop. And all they do is say, go to this service, make this call. When the answer comes back, set the model on this controller. The controller is not connected to the root. They're just ones that are created uh, just for the purpose of this. And then the controller that, that is actually um, belonging to the root, all that does is alias those other controllers and, and pull, pull the data through that, that's been set. Uh, and so you know, this is a bit of a contrived example, but what that, what that means, the reason I've, I've done it that way in this example, is that each of those controllers does serve as a, a proxy the same way as it would do to the, to the model, in the sense that you're doing an amount of um, aggregation at that point. So you get the data back from the service, you need to perform some kind of random maths on it, uh, in this case, to come up with, with just a percentage for each service, and that's bespoke to each one. Um, so essentially, that's what it's doing uh, at that level. And then the controller level is more like you'd expect normally, where all it does is just give you uh, access to, to the particular things that have been computed from the payload that's been returned. Um, but, but it seems like this is quite a good fit in the sense that you've got more than you would have normally, but essentially at the point, like you're, you're not blocking the flow, you're rendering the page normally, and then uh, you're able to actually uh, get back to normal straight away in the sense you've just got a single uh, template that that's asking that controller for information. In this case, it's using uh, some components to actually draw the information. But uh, if I go through and show you that. So these are, uh, from the bottom up, I've got a service for each one. And essentially, all that's doing is um, uh, is essentially just a plain object um, that's going to be injected into that uh, root. Uh, and all it's doing is a, a standard AJAX fix to set, set the properties on it. Um, so. Um, yeah, so I guess there's a lot of talk about services actually becoming a proper class of their own and everything, I think. Um, but like this weirdly, or I thought a bit weirdly, um, if you do this at the moment, uh, you do get these popping up uh, in the inspector quite nicely uh, in the container as being services. Um, so I'm not sure if they're ahead of the curve there, or well, that's just uh, some kind of magic. But, um, but yeah, so essentially on the route for the dashboard, uh, that service is injected along with a load of the others and the after model is essentially just um, setting up all these things to happen so so services are injected I've just grabbed those into normal vars fetch the controllers uh, and then each one is just in a simple run once to just fetch that service and then when that succeeds uh, it will then set the model on the controller um, and then to look at one of those controllers uh, if we just pick the uh, Twitter one again. So essentially this is completely contrived, but all it's doing is is just pulling the data that comes back off those that are just some arbitrary values uh, and then performing some maths on it to produce a number. Um, so that that's called utilization uh, and it's obviously observing the model that comes back. Uh, and then in the uh, in the template, uh, sorry, in the controller for the dashboard, all I'm doing is uh, so needing each one of those controllers and aliasing the usage property of each one on it. Uh, and then that essentially just gives me um, the, the whole thing back. Then I'm able to, to assign that to a property on the controller. And then from the template, um, you simply just got, um, you simply just got uh, the component just pulling through that, that single value. So it seemed like it seems like a good pattern, so I don't know if anyone else has tried to fix that or anything, but um, but it just seemed like, uh, I don't know, I've tried it a few different ways, and there's all sorts of routes you can go down, but that to me seems like the least like offensive in terms of the fact that you're not really digging into the internals at all, you've just got more of what you'd expect to have normally. Um, and I guess, depending on what, what you're actually trying to solve, potentially you don't really need um, you know, uh, necessarily those separate controllers. You could be setting those as different properties on that individual controller. Um, and I guess uh, a lot of that stuff's uh, potentially changing with 2.0 anyway and the, and the kind of attributes being set for multiple data sources and things like that. But, um, 
but yeah, it just seemed like uh, a kind of better solution than I'd seen before. So, um, so yeah, I guess uh, that's that's really what I wanted to say. I guess just that there's there's kind of I think a lot to be said for just reading the docs end to end uh, as much as you might just think you're trying to solve a problem right now. I think that probably applies to all the documentation that if you just read it end to end then it's kind of like a whole story as to what's going on and I guess that's part of what the guys were saying before about like leaving your expectations at the door is the fact that you're um, even when you think you're not doing it you are doing it because you're, you're kind of jumping into a point where you're like this seems like a controller problem and it seems like I should be able to do it with this method or in this area and that means you're already narrowing your field and not realizing that there's these other things that exist that really if you've read everything then you'll understand where to look but only once you've read everything do you know where to look um, so yeah so I guess if that's that's probably the, the main thing uh, that I take away from it is that, uh, or, or from this is just that, um, yeah, probably don't rush to fix stuff. Um, just try and uh, uh, kind of read around what you're trying to do. Um, and I guess if, if that's too frustrating, because I guess when you start, you do just want to see something work straight away, then maybe this is useful, like this project's on GitHub, so you can pull it and at least check your sanity by the fact that like this is everything plugged together that does work because I guess the other problem is that a lot of the times when you get into the examples um, some of the things are omitted in the sense of trying to make the code samples brief but actually when you're learning again especially if you've jumped into that article part way through you might not even realize that that, that has been omitted you just don't put it in the code and then wonder what the hell's going on so um, so yeah I guess at least this, <coughs> this is a start uh, and hopefully it will be useful to, to someone but, um, but yeah any questions? Yeah, yeah. Small things. Were you saying you didn't like using underscore data? Use get and then so artists don't get speech models albums. Yeah. That delves into. Uh, oh, you can fetch it just through that. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. You can do albums dot length or albums dot artist dot. Length Straight off of it. Within that string. Cool. Okay. Um, okay. You were also saying that, that you didn't know you didn't like the way that you had to have a particular data format in your adapter. There's a serializer class. No, 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 not. That yeah, no, I know, I know. Not so much that I didn't know, but just I think sometimes. So same thing again. If you're if you're reading the guides, you might read a part of the adapters that tells you about the differences between the two, and then not realise when you're reading the next example, it's exclusively talking about JSON API, and therefore, you know, it, it's. I guess to me that's subtle in the sense that the because you're because the, the, the interaction back to the model is the thing that does the fetch, that just breaks and there's nothing obvious going wrong. Like everything renders, there's no error in the, in the, in the, in the console and there's no, no action over the wire. So it's not like normally where it makes a request and it fails because it says it can't marshal the payload. It just doesn't realize there's anything to fetch because it's not you know, going through and realizing that's the relationship that it needs to evaluate. So uh, yeah, I guess it was just a bit of a gotcha. It's probably more when you're doing things like this that are just knock-ups because most of the time you're going to be either one or the other or you're intimately aware of what your payload should look like but, but yeah I just thought things like that it's kind of um, you know it's really clever what it's doing but you have to kind of realize that that there's a lot going on under the covers um, and so like it can just break at some point. But, um, we tend to use JSON API as, as the standard so our serializers transform whatever we offer the server into JSON API right. and then just use the standard adapter process Nice, okay, yeah, 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 definitely. Is no one going to ask me what happens when the resources disappear or why aren't I using resources? That's a good. So, like, I know that they're, because they're going to get, they're going to go completely as I understand it. And um, so I did look at this, because you can, you can nest routes now, obviously, but that seems to work quite differently. So um, I did try that briefly, but the, so the stuff I've got doing this basically is a lot older than this. So I brought it up to date to a point, but... Um, yeah, I just found when you so when you nest roots, it's slightly different in the sense that when you're uh, specifying the links, so uh, where you've got in here, um, say like uh, you would link to uh, album.id, that if the root if they were nested roots rather than nested resources, that would be artist.album.id. Uh, and then it seemed like it wasn't playing ball with the standard outlets, but I'm not sure if that's because you now need to name the outlets as well, or, and like they have to be named by default. I don't know, but like. Uh, uh, actually, yeah, quick show of hands, who who is aware of the difference between a resource and a root in root as it currently stands? So, a resource 
you can think of it as uh, kind of hoisting that root up to the top level so you can always refer to it by just its name on its own rather than its name nested down within all of the roots above it. Whereas if it's a root, then its name will be you know, grandparent, dot parent, then child. Whereas if it's a resource, it'll be just child and you can refer to it as child everywhere in the app. Yeah, yeah. Because um, I guess that was the other thing I didn't say actually that in the uh, in the router, um, so it might look a bit uh, mental on the URLs, but I deliberately mounted those diagrams at the same level. So that's just to, to illustrate that although you've uh, although you've got that nested hierarchy, if you want something attached to it that that you know a, a refresh or a, a direct link to isn't going to evaluate, you can still do that because I think the router is just evaluating what's at the, the the top level first. So essentially, so I guess to just to show you that if uh, if I went to um, uh, if I went to the diagram uh, level, uh, well, so I guess hold on, let's go this guy. So if I go all the way through this navigation, um, and I'm essentially at the same level that uh, that that diagram is going to be at, and I click it, I move in, and you've got the full URL. Um, but if I were to refresh that. Uh, you shouldn't see any of those network requests go out. It's just going to go straight to that route. So you can mount stuff that looks like it's at a nested level, but actually doesn't require all the work to transition through the routes to get there. So I guess that's quite powerful as well. If you've got stuff that's, you know, it makes sense from a from an information architecture point of view that it lives at that level. It's just that you don't actually need to go and fetch all the data to to pull it back. Um, but um, but yeah. Yep. Okay. Cool.